Good evening. Welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. Is this anyone's first time that you've been here before? Okay, I'm always surprised when new people come, so welcome. Um, my name is Polly Reynolds. I am the head of adult services and archives here at the library. Um, and if you're not already familiar, throughout the year, and I think a number of you have already picked up some of our author brochures, and I'll get some more of those out for you, um, we put on a wide variety of programming, and you can grab some brochures in the back, including some fabulous author programs, like tonight. I just want to take just a few minutes and talk about, if you don't mind, some upcoming programs. Um, next week, um, Andrew Revkin, June 5th, he's the strategic advisor for environmental and science journalism at the National Geographic Society, and he wrote a book called Weather and Illustrated History from Cloud Atlases to Climate Change. I'm just going to read a brief description because I think it sounds so interesting. He's going to touch on such, he's going to talk about 100 meteorological mi milestones and insights from prehistory, today's headlines, and tomorrow's forecasts. He will touch on such very topics as Earth's first atmosphere, the physics of rainbows, the deadliest hailstorm, Groundhog Day, the invention of air conditioning, <laughs> very important, London's great smog, the year without summer, our increasingly strong hurricanes, and the Paris Agreement on climate change. So that's next Tuesday. And then if you want to come back again um, on Thursday, if we have a Royals program, because we thought season, people are getting married. Um, and this one's also interesting, Eleanor Herman, she's going to come in costume and um, she showcases her delightful appreciation for all things beautiful and terrible. And her book is called The Royal Art of Poison, which uses cutting edge forensic discoveries to tell the true story of Europe's glittering palaces, one of medical bafflement, poisonous cosmetics, ever present ex excrement, festering natural illness, and sometimes murder. So I hope I've enticed you enough to come to those two programs. You can sign up for those online through our website, or you can call us at the reference desk. Um, at following tonight's program, there will be a reception and a book signing. You'll be able to meet the author, get some cookies and coffee, get your book signed. Um, and that will be in the rotunda. You'll head back in through the library. Just follow the crowd, and, and, and everyone will be there. Um, I am truly honored to in introduce tonight's speaker, Paula McLean. Paula's actually been here. This is her third time now. <laughs> we love having her. <laughs> um, she received her MFA in poetry from the University of Michigan in 1996. Since then, she's received fellowships from the Corporation of Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, the Ucross Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, and the National Endowment for the Arts. She's the author of two collections of poetry, as well as a memoir, Like Family, and novels, Ticket to Ride, The Paris Wife, and Circling the Sun. Please join me in welcoming Paula McClain. Hi. Well, you guys look great. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. I don't know how I can compete with someone who's an expert in poison. <laughs> That sounded great. I could just pretend to be an expert in poison. Um, in fact, I'm not an expert in, in, in much, um, but I think that for the last 10 years, I've become sort of an expert in this idea of finding little known women from history and drawing them out of the shadows where, for whatever reason, they've been eclipsed or marginalized or misremembered or forgotten altogether. Um, and then to shine a light on their lives and to make their lives central and significant and then hopefully if I'm doing it right, um, dramatize it and, and make it personal and intimate so that you believe that you understand something about history that you didn't before in a particular place and time in history, but on a human scale through one woman's experience. And I think if we took any single human's life and shined a light on it, we could discover why that life is meaningful. I believe that's true. Um, but I usually use a kind of intuitive process to find these subjects, these historical subjects. And it's, um, I love my job. I love my job and I love talking to people about my work and how I find my subjects. I've done 26 events in the month of May. 
because I have this new book. Um, but this time, all I had to do was get in a car because I live in Cleveland Heights. I think you guys know that, yeah. Anyway, thank you again for coming out tonight. This is a ter terrific turnout for a, a beautiful night in May, the end of May and already summer. So thank you. It's actually the great surprise of my adult life that I have found this work. And I think of it as like a vocation. This is my life's work and I am devoted to it and devoted to these women as I find them. And when I do find them, as I said, by this intuitive process that sometimes feels more like magic or like destiny, once I find them, I latch on like a junkyard dog. <laughs> And I get completely obsessed, and I don't think about anything else in the time that I'm writing the book. Um, but all of this, this whole, the last 10 years of my life came as such a surprise to me. I went to graduate school, as, as you just heard, to write poetry. Everybody knows you can't give poetry away. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? This is in the middle 1990s, and I went to graduate school at the University of Michigan to study poetry, but I did it as the divorced single parent of a two-year-old, because that made 100% sense. That made, because <laughs> obviously I was gonna make buckets of money, and um, no, I lived on student loans in married housing, and I lived on about $12,000 a year, which I had to borrow to study poetry without having any idea how I was going to pay off those loans when I got out. And I used to say, I'm going to set up a little poetry stand by the side of the road and sell poems for a dollar. But really what it meant was that I was mostly a cocktail waitress, right? You guys know that, right? So I did that for a really long time and devoted my principal energies between being a mother and being a writer, and, and, and then being a cocktail waitress, or an auto plant worker, or a nurse's aide in a nursing home, or a, um, any of the various things. I was a delivery girl for Domino's Pizza with the wedge on top of the car. <laughs> like I did all of this so that I could become a better writer, and because writing had always felt like such a central part of my identity and my, and my personhood. Um, so along the way, I published two collections of poetry. As I've said, you can't give those away. Um, nobody wants them. I published a memoir about growing up in foster care in California in the 1970s and 80s, which I did from the time I was four until I aged out of the system. At 18, I bounced with my two sisters to the California foster care system, so that was a really interesting and difficult way to grow up. So I wrote about that, and then I wrote a first novel. And the time I wrote my first novel, I lived in Cleveland Heights, very near Lee Road, and at this point, I was remarried. I had three kids. I had like a one-year-old, a three-year-old, a 13-year-old who barely spoke to me because he walked around with his hoodie over his head, like all pulled down saying things like, nobody understands me. I like to remind him of that now. He's 25. Um, but at the time, my husband was working at Cleveland State and taught all the time, and I had three different part-time teaching jobs, one of which was at John Carroll. And you know when you're an adjunct teacher, they pay you like a buck twenty-five and some cat food, <laughs> and you have like a hundred students. So I did that, and I had three, these three kids, but I was always writing. And because my husband worked all the time, I ha uh, an hour a day, I would like go up to the, the, the public library on Lee Road in Cleveland Heights, and I would write this novel, which took me five years to write because A, I was teaching myself how to write a novel by writing a novel, which meant mostly writing it over and over and over and over again, and figuring out things like plot. I had never written anything with a plot. I wrote poetry, and then I wrote the story of my own life, which already comes handily with its own plot. <laughs> Also, you don't have to invent any characters. You have to listen to them talk. But So here was this new creature, and I had read about a million novels myself, but I had never written one. So, But then I had these three kids, and you know when you have these kids, and they want everything from you, and you want to give them everything, and you're not sure, though, who you are or what you can ask for for yourself and what you care about on your own time. And what I cared about was this book. And even if I only had an hour a day, what I wanted to give that book in that hour a day was everything, all of my thoughts, 
and feelings and e everything I'd ever learned and I wanted to pour it into this book and into the lives of these characters which already felt like my very best friends and so I did that and when that book came out in 2008 my son was like two years old well nobody bought that book unfortunately I remember this event that I did I had to like drive for three hours through a blizzard to Pittsburgh to a Joseph Beth where there was like one person there and they had lined up 50 chairs and there was one person there and first of all I was crushed because they lined up the 50 chairs and then you're not sure if that woman knows where she is or if, <laughs> or you know she escaped from a lunatic asylum or she got lost on the way or she's just taking a rest so I sat down next to her and I said um, let's not talk about me let's talk about you and can I buy you a coffee <laughs> Anyway, so along this way, I'd been writing for about 15 years, and I'm a scrappy person. Like, I was always going to keep writing, no matter whether people bought my books or not. But I did start to think that maybe I hadn't found a big idea. So then, that year, 2008, I was teaching this class in memoir at John Carroll, and I decided I wanted to go take a look at Ernest Hemingway's memoir, A Movable Feast. Do we know it? Do we know it? So for those of you who don't know it, it's a series of autobiographical vignettes that Hemingway wrote at the end of his life. So he died by suicide in Ketchum, Idaho in 1961. Most people know that. There were pages of this in his typewriter on the day that he died. But it's really about the beginning of his career and his literary apprenticeship in Paris. He was 21 when he moved to Paris in 1921 and he hadn't published anything yet. And I call him a whippersnapper. Like he was a whippersnapper and he hadn't published anything yet, but he wanted to eat the world and he wanted to change the world with his writing. And he had this beautiful ambition to be up in his rooftop garret writing one true sentence at a time one true sentence about everything he knew in his gut to be true. And to me, that was a beautiful ambition, and it was familiar to me. I, I recognize that. That's exactly what, what I had felt all this time, trying to devote my life to writing. So I didn't know when I read A Movable Feast this young Hemingway, and so I became really, really, uh, almost immediately obsessed with Paris in the 1920s and the young Hemingway, which was so unfamiliar to me because this guy, he seemed very unlike the sort of garrulous gargoyle Hemingway that we know from later in life, right? The old man in the sea Hemingway, who was a misogynist and an alcoholic and a big game hunter, and it was so macho he must be gay, right? <laughs> People ask me that, by the way. They ask me, was he gay? They also ask me, was he impotent? And then I have to remind them that I wasn't really there. <laughs> I wasn't actually there. I made it up. But So here I was reading this book and becoming, as I said, completely obsessed. And you know how that is when certain books come to us at certain times, and we don't know why, they just kind of like blow our doors off and we have that great experience where the everything falls away. And I live for that, for that book where everything falls away and I don't care if it's one o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning or if I have to get up the next day or nothing else exists except the world of this book. And if you've read A Movable Feast, it's not always a happy book like because no one could lose friends and piss people off like Ernest Hemingway and mostly he's turning his attention on everybody else but I'm a nosy writer. I want to know what's going on in his own personal life. So he just moved to Paris. He's becoming sort of a, a kind of a godlike figure at the center of this group of expats. But he's also newly married to this woman named Hadley Richardson, whose name only comes up twice in the book. And he comes home from writing in his rooftop garret and then walking through the Luxembourg Gardens with a hole in his shoe and a shabby jacket. And then he goes to Gertrude Stein's salon and they, they're geniuses together. And then um, he goes home to his wife, Hadley, but he calls her Tatie. And she calls him Tatie. And I have no idea what those nicknames mean. And I don't even care. I was just besotted with them. And I had all these questions all these questions. How did they meet? And, and how did they get to Paris? And what was it like to be in Paris in the most delicious and glamorous 
and exciting time in history. And then what did it feel like to be married to Ernest Hemingway before he was Ernest Hemingway, before he invented himself and then lost himself through ambition and betrayal and all of that other stuff. And Hemingway was not going to tell me any of these things. And so I had to find them out for myself. And that's what I did. So one day, instead of walking up to the Cleveland Heights Public Library, I drove myself downtown to the public library because I thought, if there's anything to be learned about Hadley, it's going to be there. And I found some biographies of her life. Lo and behold, they were there. And I just selected one off the shelf, and I opened it up on the table, and I read one paragraph that was really just an excerpt from a letter that she wrote to a girlfriend of hers not long after she met Hemingway at a party in Chicago in 1920. And just that one little letter, I just felt like she flared up out of that book like a genie out of the bottle, and she was just there in the library, and I just had this like lightning bolt idea, like, this is it. Like, this is my girl, and she's got a story to tell. And she's saying, pay attention to me. My story hasn't been told, even though his story has. And I thought, this is it. Like, I can tell a movable feast from Hadley's point of view. And I felt like I'd been electrocuted, or like I was going to self-combust, like right there in the library. And I speed read it just as fast as I possibly could. And I went home, and my hands are shaking on the steering wheel of my Subaru and I went home and I wrote my literary agent an email. Now this is the one that had suffered with me through all the books that um, did not sell and when your books don't sell they send you negative royalty statements in the mail (laughs) in case you're confused and that's not a happy day in my house but um, I went home and I wrote her an email and I said forget anything I've ever told you about what I'm working on I'm writing a novel about Ernest Hemingway's first marriage in Paris, and there is sex and absinthe and bullfighting and a menage a trois on the French Riviera. And she wrote back almost immediately and said, oh my God, you are going to write that book. Write it as fast as you can. (laughs) Write it as fast as you can. Well, of course, that's what I wanted her to say. I had been electrocuted. Like something, the sky opened. I finally had this big idea. But as I said, it took me five years to write the first novel, and I thought, I'm going to die, literally, if I don't get an opportunity to write this book right away. And so I did a crazy thing. I sat my husband down, and I said, I'm going to die if I don't write this book. And he said, "Um, well, we can't have that, because who's going to take care of these children? (laughs) And he picked up the phone. And this is 2008. The economy is doing this. He picked up the phone and he called his mother and borrowed money so that I could quit all three of my teaching jobs and sit in a Starbucks in Cleveland Heights and write my face off. And that's what I did. The Cedar uh, Fairmont Starbucks in Cleveland Heights. You could have found me there every single day at the end of 2008 and most of 2009. And every single day I would schlep in my research materials. I had never done research for a book, but newsflash, I had also never been to Paris. Not in any century. I had never been to Paris, nor could I afford to go there because I had these three kids and a mortgage. I now had no jobs, and I owed my mother-in-law money. But what I could do, which was I had always been able to do, what I could do was read. And so that's what I did. I just read everything. I read everything I could possibly find on 1920s Paris. I decided I needed to reread all of Hemingway, but particularly the early stuff, and really paying attention this time, because I had just like skated over everything in high school. I didn't remember anything. So I decided I like Hemingway could teach me some things about dialogue, for instance. And then I had to reread of Scott Fitzgerald, and I had to learn about that crazy Gertrude Stein. Who was she anyway? And uh, and Zelda, and all of that, and biographies of these people. And 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 then somehow it happened. I couldn't afford to go to Paris, but I went to Paris in my imagination. And you're like, yay, but no, but it was better. Like, it was, in a way, seriously, I mean this, I mean this. There's something magical that happens when, and you guys know, right, it's called armchair travel. And when you fall into that world as a reader, 
let's say you read a book and it and it just it just as I said it blows your doors off and then they make a movie of it and then you refuse to go to the movie because you know they're going to ruin it because you already know that you can imagine something far beyond what any budget could possibly come close to because this is our superpower up here and so I had this superpower and every single day I sat in the same chair in that Starbucks and every sa- single day they played this, the same Nora Jones CD every day. <laughs> the same, it was like the soundtrack to my life. And for a dollar and 85 cents, which is what it cost for a tall, dark roast coffee, that was my office. And I wrote the book in seven months, which is better than five years. Better than five years. And it was more fun than I've ever had in my whole stinking life because I was in Paris. I wasn't in Cleveland in the middle of winter with three kids and all these pressures and and it really felt like I was in Paris and that the reason I could go there was because I had found this woman or she had found me and I just had the authority and the conviction. I thought I understood something about her. That somehow I was like an actress and this was the role of my life and I was inside her consciousness and looking out through her eyes and seeing everything Paris and Ernest, and here was my best friend about to betray me, and here was my the love of my life about to break my heart nine ways from Sunday, and all of it felt so personal, and it was happening to me. And I wrote the book, as I said, in seven months, and then when it uh, was published in 2011, this really bizarre thing happened, um, which was that people read it. <laughs> people read it. So that's a win. That is a win. And almost immediately, it was amazing, almost immediately they they read it and I went out on tour and instead of one person, you know, lost, escaped, <laughs> in a Joseph Beth, I would go to places like this. Oh, you guys are beautiful. You came out of your house to listen to me talk about literature. This is a win. This is a win. And so one of the first events that I did was in Ann Arbor, which is where I had gone to graduate school school, and like borrowed all the money to to be a poet. Um, And I was getting ready to go do an event at the Borders. I'm sure you guys all remember Borders, rest in peace Borders. Um, And I was in the hotel getting ready to go do this event and my agent called me on the phone and she said that that book had landed on the New York Times bestseller list. So beyond my wildest imaginings, but also it just felt so, it just felt like I had gotten a big wet kiss from the universe, like (laughs) that I was in the right place at the right time because this is where I had suffered and this is where I'd gone all in as a writer and like my family was worried for my mental stability. Like you're doing what? You're getting a degree in what? And you're paying for it? Like, and no one will ever pay you to do that. You know that, but... And there it was, and the book just kept selling, and it was on the Times list for like a year and a half, and now it's in 34 languages, and millions of people have read it. And it seems to me to be a testament to something mysterious. Something happened. Something happened when I found Hadley, that like my empathy was woken up in a way that had never been before, my interest and curiosity in history, the engine of my empathetic imagination, like all of it, it just felt like I, I just was 10 times bigger than I was before and 10 times uh, a better writer. And all of this was happening very, very quickly. And so, of course, I was going to do it again <laughs> almost immediately if I could because, like, what's more fun than this? And history suddenly was just so fascinating to me. But also it felt like a feminist act, this idea of taking this woman, like, out of the shadows and then making her life matter and, and then now everybody knows it. And again, one of the first events that I did was in St. Louis, which is Hadley's hometown where she was born and raised. And I went to go to this event and I spoke to all the good people of St. Louis and I decided I was gonna read a chapter from the book set in St. Louis. And so I read this and uh, the Q&A started and the first thing that happened was this octogenarian gentleman in the front row stood up and he had a, a walker and his hands were shaking and he stood up and his voice was shaking and he said, that was just beautiful. Aunt Hadley would have loved it. I know, I know. Amazing, amazing, absolutely amazing. And he cried and it was her nephew and he said, you know, Aunt Hadley taught me how to dance. 
And she was the most amazing woman, and now the whole world will know it. And the whole world does know it, because this book just continues to touch lives, and, and it's absolutely amazing. So this is my gig now. Like This is what I do. This is what I get to do, and I absolutely love it. Martha Gellhorn, who is the subject of Love and Ruin, never crossed my radar as a potential subject and I'm always looking for potential subjects and people write me emails every single week and they give me ideas. Somebody tonight is going to hand me a post-it note <laughs> and say what about so and so or what about did you think about I mean the thing about this genre is it really does suggest other women from history whose lives deserve to be illuminated. But Martha Gellhorn never crossed my radar, not for a single second, because she just happened to have been married for a while to this guy named Ernest Hemingway. Mm -hmm. And I was never going to write about him again, because then I would be that crazy writer who could only write about Ernest Hemingway. But the other thing was, when I was working on The Paris Wife, I identified so deeply with Hadley's story. I, t I was her. And he broke my heart nine ways from Sunday, so why would I want to spend any more time with that guy? <laughs> but then this crazy thing happened. So this was years after I finished The Paris Wife, after I finished the follow-up novel, which is called Circling the Sun. Have we read it? Beryl Markham. She's so fabulous. She's so fabulous. So it's a historical figure named Beryl, Beryl Markham. She was a record-breaking, pioneer, trailblazing, badass aviator who was the first person to fly the Atlantic nonstop and solo in 1936. She was also a racehorse trainer, and she grew up in colonial Kenya, and she was involved with all those Out of Africa characters and madly in love with Dennis Finch Hatton, who I call Robert Redford in my private life. <laughs> So it's this great story. So I worked on this book, and then I was well on my way to researching another historical figure when I had this bizarre dream that was so vivid and, and spooky and witchy and prophetic that I had to pay attention to it. So I'm fishing in the dream with Hemingway. We're fishing, and his boat was named Pilar, and I've seen pictures of it and read books about it and done all this research, so I knew exactly what it would look like looked like and there we were in the Gulf Stream and he was up on the flying bridge and he was wearing um, white shorts and a white dirty white t-shirt and a rope for a belt and uh, it was tan and he looked like really good up there and he's got all my attention and he's squinting into the sun and the, and the dream changes because I notice that there's a woman across from me and she's facing the sea and as I'm wondering who she is a marlin crested out of the gulf and it's massive fish gargantuan fish and it twists its body and like water droplets are flying out in this like totally prismatic technicolor way and time stops long enough for the woman to reach out and put a piece of bait in the fish's mouth and then the fish lands with a crash and takes off and the whole boat spins around and takes off after the fish and in the dream I think what kind of woman hand feeds a marlin? And then she turned and faced me and locked eyes with me, and it was Martha Gellhorn. Now, I recognized her because of all my years of research on Hemingway's life. So I knew two things. I knew she was wife number three of four, and I knew she was a journalist. And that was all. But the next morning, the dream was still with me, and I thought, what was that? What was that? And so the, I Googled her over coffee the next morning, because that's what we can do now, right? We go to the Googles. And so I went to her Wikipedia page, and uh, it took me about five minutes, and I um, wanted to just crawl under a rock and die of shame, because I had no idea who she was. I had no idea who she was, someone who had been so close to her life, but also someone who purports to do this amazing feminist thing and draw these women's lives out of the shadows and all of this stuff. And there she had been this whole time, right under my nose. I didn't know anything. I didn't know that she was one of the most significant journalistic voices of the 20th century, that she had a nearly 60-year career as a war correspondent, 
60 years. She took on her first war at 28 and her last at 81 with the invasion of Panama. Think about all the 81-year-olds you know, and then imagine them going off to war, and then you know just how extraordinary she was. She published 14 books in her lifetime. She traveled to almost 60 countries. She lived in about 10 of them. She was over and over again like the most original, iconoclastic, trailblazing, badass, just the kind of woman I go looking for every single day. And there she was. And I just thought, OK, if this is a sign, I'm taking it because in, in a way, I don't even care. That, he, that she was married to him because um, she was just too undeniable. She was just too undeniable. And so I started off on this process of exploring her life. And, and it, really is, it really is such an honor and a privilege to get to do this thing that I do. So here I am channeling this woman who, as I said, like went to war at 28. And if you don't know the story, at 28, Martha Gellhorn was on vacation with her family. Now, she's another St. Louis girl. And the crazy thing is, she and Hadley grew up less than three miles apart in St. Louis. Right? They, uh, their birthdays are one day apart. Martha's father was an obstetrician and gynecologist, very prominent in St. Louis, and for a while was Hadley's doctor. And yet the two women never met. They married the same man, and they never met. So crazy, crazy, crazy. But Hadley and uh, Martha are very, very different women. And uh, when Martha was 28, she walked into a bar in Key West called Sloppy Joe's when she was on vacation with her mother and brother in Key West. And there he was, her literary hero, reading his mail. And she'd always read, and he was, like I said, he was her hero, and there he was, and he was getting ready to go off and report on the Spanish Civil War. Do we know anything about the Spanish Civil War? Does anybody know a little bit about it? I'm going to give you the two-second Reader's Digest condensed version. It's far too pretty a night to talk about war, but in 1936, um, there was a newly elected democratic government in Spain and a guy named Franco, we know his name, overthrew that government and he did it by going village to village, slaughtering tens of thousands of people. And all of Europe turned a blind eye to Spain because they thought it was really none of their business. That was Spain's battle and FDR in the US. Everybody basically said, this has nothing to do with us. And so something quite extraordinary happened that had never happened before, which was that ordinary people Ordinary people who had never held a gun before and never gone to war before found a way to get over to Spain, 40,000 of them, to fight for Spain against Franco, believing that this was po probably the last moment to fight fascism because of what was going to happen in Europe next. And of course, we know all of that stuff did happen in Europe next because Franco formed these alliances with Hitler and Mussolini. We know those guys, too. And all of this, this shadow, got cast over Europe, but for that one moment, there was this noble, completely idealistic opportunity to stand up for something that was right. And Hemingway is about to go off and do this. And here's this very young, idealistic Martha Gellhorn, who had always wanted to be a foreign correspondent, watching her literary hero go off to war. And she's like, I'm going to do that too. Well, at the moment, she had only done six months cub reporting for the Albany Union Times, reporting on women's country club lunches and the morgue beat. But she wants to go off to war, and she finds a way to do it. She doesn't have the money to go, so she writes an article for Vogue magazine about the beauty problems of the middle-aged woman. She was 28. She had no beauty problems. But she got $300 from that article, and she got her way over to France, and then she crossed the border from France into Spain in the middle of the night, alone, with no Spanish, <laughs> and 50 bucks, like, rolled up and tucked in her boot, and this burning conviction to be where important things in history were, ha were happening. And she also had a fake letter that she had begged from an editor friend in New York that said, basically, Martha Gellhorn is a special correspondent for this magazine when she was nothing of the kind. She totally bluffed her way over. She lied her way over. She went over on like pure nerve 
and grit and like chutzpah. Like, this is so fascinating to me. And so when she's there, like, here's Madrid in 1937, surrounded on three sides by Franco's army. The city of Madrid has been besieged for five months. It's being shelled every single day. She's in a hotel. The nearest front line is a mile walking from her hotel, which is being shelled every single day. And this was her first war. And this was her coming of age, too, as a writer, because as she was looking around her, all the other correspondents, most of whom were men, were paying attention to the things that everybody had always paid attention to. This is a war. We're going to go out to the front. We're going to talk about what the, the, what the what happened in the battle that day, how many people died, what the you know statistics were, the artillery, like all of that stuff. But she had never been to war before, and she didn't know how it was done. So she looked around her, and she thought, what about these people? Like, what about these people whose lives have been ripped apart by war? You know, what about these children who have to walk to school every single day through trails of blood? And what about these women who not know have no home, but they have to stand in line every single day um, for bread, knowing that they could be shelled and killed at any moment, and their children could die at any moment? And that's what she was interested in. And this is why Martha Gellhorn changed the face of journalism, because nobody had ever asked that question before. What happens to ordinary people in war? And so... Being in her shoes as she discovers herself at war was completely fascinating to me. And then to get to know a different side of Hemingway. When Hadley met Hemingway at a party in Chicago in 1920, he was a whippersnapper who had never published anything yet. And when Marty walked into Sloppy Joe's in 1936, he was the most famous writer in America. So this is, these are different people entirely. And their love story is so different to me. They kind of remind me, Marty and... And Ernest kind of remind me of um, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, right? Or like Bogey and Bacall. Like what happens when two really big personalities get together and they're equals in every way? And she was the only one of his four wives who actually could match him, you know, in terms of courage and grit and like just raw intellect and, and ability as a writer. I mean, she's phenomenal. But of course, they were woo, far too much alike to ever, you know, do anything but spar and like throw crockery. And, and they, you know, they like can't live with each other and they can't live without each other. And to me, that turbulent, like totally stormy, tumultuous love affair tracks with what's happening in history because the world is a much darker place for Ernest and Martha than it was for Hadley and Ernest too because every the shadow is falling over Europe and nothing is ever going to be the same again and they're falling in love and if my books tell you anything at all it's don't marry that guy <laughs> don't marry that guy but she does, she does, she does. She marries him in 1940, and one journalist calls it a pairing of flint and steel. And they go to Cuba, where they, she finds a house, an abandoned estate, 15 miles outside of Havana, and she decides that she's going to love it and save it as she hadn't been able to save Spain. And she does it all on her, on her own, and she spends the money, and she falls madly in love with this house, and there are going to be two writers writing under one roof. And for a while, they are very happy there. Now, that house still stands. Has anybody been to Havana? Has anybody been to Ernest Hemingway's house in Havana? Isn't it cool? It's amazing. So Marty founded in 1939. She lived there until 1945 when they split bitterly. It was his primary residence until 1960. And in 1960, another violent coup, this time by a guy named Fidel Castro, changed Cuba forever. And when Hemingway was forced to leave his home, he'd been there for 21 years, he didn't know if he would ever be able to return, and he didn't. He died. July of 1961 and so that's why everything that's still in the house is still in the house like it's all still there like the furniture Marty picked out in 1939 is in the house and the art is on the wall and 10,000 books are on the shelves and his closet is full of shoes and his reading glasses are by the bed like it's crazy and people um when they go to Havana and they want to visit the Hemingway house, they uh, pay five Cuban dollars to uh, climb the lane and look in the open windows and doors because that's the kind of museum that it is. 
they want to protect what they have and they can't just let people walk through. But I decided that I was going to die if I didn't get in the house. <laughs> so I spent months petitioning the Cuban government and uh, writing to the current director of the museum uh, to let me in the house. And I didn't want to say I was a novelist, but I decided, because I, I wanted to be very serious. I wanted to be a researcher. But then I mentioned to her, this uh, director of the museum, that I had written a book called The Paris Wife about Hemingway, and she had read the book, and so knew I was an ally and an aficionado of Hemingway, and she let me come to the house, and I was able to spend days in the house, and I sat in his kitchen which was just so crazy. It was so crazy and looked through thousands of pieces of archival material that nobody has really seen because they were like in boxes and stuff in a, in a shed that before, you know, when the embargo happened in Eisenhower and all that stuff, like Cuba just shut down and now it's all still there. It was absolutely extraordinary to stand in the house and to reimagine their love story and to imagine her and to conjure her or to channel her or whatever I do when I'm writing about these women and what I'm really fascinated by is how she becomes herself how she finds her true calling as a storyteller she finds her voice in what is very much a man's world right how she holds on to her identity being married to one of the most celebrated and virile writers of all time and it was a completely fascinating story. You know, one thing about Marty Gellhorn, and I'll close here, and just one story, it's my absolute favorite story, so I have to tell you. In 1944, when she and Hemingway were quarreling, and uh, the D-Day was about to happen, right, and she had been covering the war in, in Europe and in France, um, they were in a huge fight, and he did this crazy thing, which was to call her magazine and offer his byline to, her, to them as a senior correspondent. And basically, she was out of a job, and she had, I know, it's terrible, that dirty rat. <sighs> How dare he? And she had no way over, and she had no job and no credentials, just like in the beginning. So you know what she does? Same grit. Right, same chutzpah as before. She uh, lied her way onto a hospital barge, locked herself in the john, drank a bunch of whiskey because she thought she was going to be arrested, fell asleep on the floor, woke up the next day. She didn't even know what boat she got on. She woke up the next day finding that she was on the hospital barge that was the first to arrive at the battle at Normandy and that she had a front row seat for this battle that history would never forget. And while hundreds and hundreds of accredited journalists were off in the um, distance, watching through binoculars, including Ernest Hemingway, who had stolen her credentials, um, she went ashore in a water uh, ambulance as a stretcher bearer, helping to recover the wounded. And that's how it was. There were, there were 150,000 men on Omaha Beach and one woman. And it's that woman. So how can we not pay attention to her life? And yet, the other day, I was in St. Louis. Again, I did an event in St. Louis. And, and by the way, members of Marty's family showed up at my event in St. Louis, which was such wonderful um, kismet. But on the way from the airport, I had my driver. I have Marty Gellhorn's childhood home memorized, right? So I'm like, take me to 4366 McPherson Street. So the driver takes me, and I have a book, and I climb the steps, and I knock on the door, and a woman answers the door, and I get very excited, and I say, my name is Paula McLean, and I've written this novel about Martha Gellhorn, who grew up in this house, and she was a journalist and, and a war correspondent, and I start to talk, and she stands back and puts her hand on her hips. She's like, well, I know that. You know, I mean, this is St. Louis. Everybody knows Martha Gellhorn grew up here, and I know this is her house, and I'm really proud to live in this house and to sort of have this part of her legacy. She's like, but when I tell my girlfriends that I live in Martha Gellhorn's house, they all say, wasn't she married to Ernest Hemingway for a while? So here's the really ironic thing. When they split in 1945, bitterly, head to head. She made it a point never to let his name be mentioned in her presence because she said, I do not see myself as a footnote to someone else's life. And yet, so here's this woman. She says, when my friends tell me this, I say she was in every way her own woman and maybe you should learn about her. 
So I will just close tonight by saying she was her own woman in every way, and maybe you should learn about her. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're hot and we need some cake or cookies or whatever, but um, if there are questions, I would really be delighted to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Hi. The question is, I spent all this time reading about Paris. Did I finally get there? I did. I did, finally. It took me um, about a year and a half after I finished the book. Once they started paying me in actual money <laughs> instead of cat food, I decided that it was safe to go to Paris, and I did what I call my stalking Hemingway tour of France and Spain. And it's all still there. Like, you can go to all those good cafes on the Boulevard Montparnasse, and you can stand outside of their first apartment and outside of Gertrude Stein's salon and walk his path through the Luxembourg Gardens. And there's a book called Hemingway's Walks in Paris. Does anybody know this little book? Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And I did that. I just was a crazy person, just like weeping in front of his apartment. And, and then I went to Pamplona, and I went to the south of France, where Pauline and Hadley and Ernest lived menage a trois in 1926. And the hotel where they lived is still there. And I walked out of the sun into the hotel, and there's a picture of the three of them inside. And it was, it was completely amazing. So why did they preserve, why did the Cuban government preserve? So Hemingway was always a very important figure to Cuba, in, and he considered himself kind of dual citizenship, even though it was not legal. He lived there for so long, and was such a, there was really such a part of the fabric of his being. Cuba considers him a very significant personage in their history. And if you go to the Floridita, you know, where he drank a daiquiri, there's this big bronze bust, and you can stand there and have your daiquiri. Your Papa Doble, Doble or whatever, which is the dub, Papa's double, like the double daiquiri. And, um, and so I did that when I was in Havana. And I made it a point to stand there long enough to ask everybody who came and wanted to pose next to his statue what their favorite Hemingway book was. And only one in ten had read one. <laughs> no, but here's the shocking thing. Like, they hadn't read a novel, but they all knew who he was because we know who he is. It's, I mean, to me, it's, fa it's fascinating. But there's always time to read. I, I haven't given up on in any of those people. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, there's a movie out, Nicole Kidman. Is it that, so do you see her in that role? So the question is, there's a movie out called Gellhorn and Hemingway, or Hemingway and Gellhorn. Um, it's an HBO movie, and it was, I think, out in 2012. And the question was, do I see her, Marty, in Nicole Kidman, who plays Gellhorn? Uh, Clive Owen plays Hemingway. And of course, they look great. I mean, they look amazing. And she looks fabulous in trousers. I mean, Nicole Kidman, she's such a star. But I couldn't watch the movie because almost immediately, because I'd already done all this research and I knew who, they, I feel very um, territorial about my characters. And so I knew how they met because I had her letters and her journals and all this biography and I'd read the story. And so in the movie, she walks into Sloppy Joe's bar, he's there, there's a fish, massive fish hanging from a hook in the middle of the bar. He's drunk as a skunk, he's drinking whiskey out of the bottle and then plants a kiss on the fish's mouth and she's over in the bar like in these great trousers like giving him the giving him the vixen side eye you know like she's going to land him like a kudu but the funniest part is that later when she shows up in Spain in Madrid she arrives in Spain like cruising down the Gran Via in a tank and she jumps out of the tank and says where's the war boys <laughs> I know, I know, and I just knew that, like, Gellhorn herself, and it's a fun movie, and er lots of people love it, and I'm not, not telling you don't love, like, love that story, but also understand that she would roll over in her grave. 
just to have someone put those words in her mouth. So a few more questions. Yeah, in the center. Hi. How did you get to Markham? How did I get to Beryl Markham? So it's a good story, and I started off by saying that sometimes it feels like, it feels like fate or like magic when I find these characters, or they find me, or some. So I was on vacation with my brother in law and my sister in Orlando and I had been working for three years on a novel that wasn't working so after The Paris Wife I started writing about Marie Curie which totally should have worked but it was really boring like she never could get out of her laboratory she's like <laughs> stirring the pitch blend in like bad shoes it was just bad it was bad I was suffering I wrote it over and over and over again, and it was still, she was still stirring. <laughs> Bad. And I went on vacation with my brother-in-law and my sister in Florida, and we're out by the pool, and I'm bemoaning my fate and that I'm unhappy. And um, my brother-in-law is reading a book called West with the Night by Beryl Markham. And he keeps, uh, out by the pool, like shirtless, and he keeps looking up and looking at me and saying, oh my God, do you know who this woman, this Beryl Markham? I think she's amazing. She's just the sort of person that you would like. She's like, he's like, I think you're going to write about her. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, people tell me all the time what I'm going to write about. And if there's magic in the universe, it's not going to come to Orlando. And it's certainly not going to come through my brother-in-law because he's not that interesting. (laughs) So I just ignored him. I totally ignored him. And at the end of the weekend, he's like, you're so stupid and really stubborn and she's amazing and you're going to write about her and so I took that book home was with the night and it sat on my bookshelf for like in my dining room for like a year and a half until one day I was dusting and I saw the spine and I'm like oh that book and just because I was bored I just took it out and I let it fall open and I read one paragraph set in Beryl's Kenyan childhood and all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I just thought here we go I didn't even know who she was yet, but I knew I was going to write about her because of that physical reaction. I didn't even know enough to turn the book over to see that there was a blurb from Ernest Hemingway on the back (laughs) because they met on safari in 1937 when he was there with his second wife, Pauline, who is the one that we don't like so much. Um, (laughs) But the other crazy thing, and this is the last thing I'll say, the other crazy thing that I didn't know when I already had started the book is that Beryl was four years old when she was abandoned by her mother, and I was four years old when I was abandoned by her mother, and her mother came back 16 years later when she was 20, and my mother came back 16 years later when I was 20 and made things really interesting. And so, you know, if you, this genre is so weird, like it's fiction, but it's also fact, and it's history, but it's also fantasy, and I'm imagining all this, and and it's this really interesting tapestry of the two and if you like handed ten different writers the historical facts on record and say here you write this book they would write ten different books but I could only write one book and she changed my life and now she'll always be with me and so will Marty and so will Hadley and if you can't tell I like my work thank you so much (laughs)